Okay, so in the other video we were talking about osmosis, so we're going to continue from that. If you have not watched part one of cell membrane transport, please go back and watch part one. This is only part two. So uh, cells in, in a situation like this, when the inside concentration and water potentials are the same as the inside and outside, it are in what we call an isotonic environment. What that means is that this is just like a situation of the room that we talked about in the other video. The same amount of stuff is going to go in and out. So that means that overall there will be no net movement. Now there will still be movement of water out and in, but there will be no net movement. This cell is called an equ equilibrium, all right? Now, if you see here, what's going on here? The concentration of the solute is higher on the inside than the outside, and the water potential is higher on the outside. Remember, it's always backwards. What that means is that the cell is one is what I call a hypotonic solution, which means the, 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 the outside is less concentrated. Hypo means less, right? Has less concentrated in the inside. So what does that mean? That means that the solute is going to go ahead and move in a certain direction while water is going to move in the other. So let's think about that. So in which direction will this move? So the, the water molecule, think about it, is going to move in the inside. Remember, from high potential to low potential. So 90 outside, 80 inside, so it's going to go in that direction. Well, if you think about the solute, then what is, what is the solute going to be doing? The solute is going to be doing the opposite. The solute is going to be doing from high potential to low potential. So even as the solute is diffusion outwards, the cell, the cell is still growing because the water is going inside, right? Now, if you, if you have a hypertonic solution, which is the opposite. In this case, you're going to have more concentration on the outside and on the inside. You're going to get the opposite happening. So again, the solute is going to go in the, in the direction of the solute concentration. So it's from the outside to the inside, which means osmosis is going to happen in the opposite direction. So osmosis will happen in from the inside to the outside. So in this case, the cell would shrink, right? Uh, because of that. So what, what, let's think about that. So if you have, if you compare two solutions, you can describe them hypertonic as hyper or above, and hypo is below, and iso is the same. So what would that do to a cell? All right. In a, if the cell has is in a, in a hypertonic environment, that means that there's less. The, the inside of the cell ha, has more stuff in it. So the water is going to gush inside the cell and make the cell engorge. Right. If it's the opposite. If the cell is in a hypertonic solution, the outside means, water, means more water back up. So that means the cell is going to lose water and shrink or shrivel. Now, and then if it's an isotonic solution, it will stay the way it is. So this is an example of what would happen to a red blood cell in those scenarios, all right? Um, now, remember that this process right here, the first process, is called... Um, cytolysis because it could, if it keeps going like this it could pop the cell while the middle process is called um, um, plasmolysis because what's breaking is not the cell but the plasma you know you're, miss, you're losing the plasma while the, on the first one the cells are being broken so cytolysis and on the third one you just the cells is an equilibrium so that's the so that's what it's called so there you go this is what I was talking about so on the isotonic solution you have equilibrium on and on that movement on a hypotonic solution, you got water coming inside, and you're gonna get cytolysis. And in a hypertonic solution, the water will leak, leak, and you're gonna get plasmolysis. So again, this is an example of what will happen. The cell will swell and burst, or shrink and shrivel, depending on what will happen. And if, so if you put, what, what does that mean? Let's stop to think about that. If you have too much salt in your blood, what will happen, right? That basically means that the cells, all the white blood cells, will start to shrivel, right? And that means the blood will gain water. Uh, the kidneys will stop retaining salt, and instead, will instead of putting water towards the bladder, they're going to retain water, which is going to make your blood pressure go higher because you have more liquid in your in your blood cells. And, and you say in your in your things. So what, what happens if you have less salt? If you don't have a lot of salt, the cells will all engorge, get the water out of the blood. Meanwhile, the kidneys are doing the same thing because they need to control this, you know, this whole thing, this osmotic pressure needs to be controlled. But that means you're getting the water out of the blood, in the bladder, and in that case, you're gonna get lower blood pressure. So the body regulates the osmotic pressure with the amount of water in the blood inside the cells. It's all part of this osmosis thing. So it's very important uh, for regulation. And you see it here, real pictures of those things we talked about before. You, you obviously have the isotonic cell on the left, the hypotonic solution in the in the middle where the cell engorges, and then the hypertonic solution where the cell shrivels up. Um, and then 
uh, here again, another drawing about the same thing. Now, notice the difference between what happens in this, state, in this situation in a plant cell versus an uh, animal cell. In a, in a a over there for the for the, for the plant uh, for the animal cell. What do you got there? That's a hypotonic solution because the cell is shriveling. Let's look at B. This is, uh, sorry, uh, engorging. For B, the cell is shriveling, which means it's a hypertonic solution. And for C, it would have to be an isotonic solution. Now, I want you to notice what happens to the plant cell. Okay, in a plant cell, it's not really changing the shape of the cell. Like, look at the, how, how much the shape of the animal cell is being changed, but on the plant cell, it's not being changed so much. How come? The plant cell has what? A cell wall. So the, uh, we talked about that in a previous lecture, that the idea that the cell wall helps maintain the shape of the cell. So what it will end up happening, and oh, there's one more reason too, that the plant cells are the central vacuole that helps control the turgor pressure or the water pressure that's part of the cell. So look at that. In, in, the, in the left side here, all the parts of the cell are shriveled and the vacuole looks smaller than usual. That means the, water, the cell is losing water. Cells lose water in hypertonic solutions, so that's probably going to be hypertonic. On the middle here, you have a cell that looks the way it's supposed to look, so it's got to be an isotonic solution. And on the left, on the right side, you have a cell that's looking engorged with a really large vacuole, but it doesn't change much. That's an example of a hypertonic solution. Now let's think about which situation is better for these cells. For an animal cell, you don't want the cell popping or shriveling, so an isotonic solution is probably the best. But what about for a plant cell? What makes a plant cell happy? For plant cells to remain their shape, it's better for them to have a full vacuole. And remember, plant cells need water for photosynthesis all the time. So that means plant cells like to be filled with water, even more water than usual. So that means the hypotonic environment is, makes, makes plant cells happy. Which means if you go ahead and throw salt around the plant, that's going to be a problem because the plant is going to be in the hypertonic environment. Um, so plants that live in salty environments have to have special adaptations to protect their cells from the extra amount of salt. And if you think about animals, you do the same thing. If you get a little bit of salt and throw it on the caterpillar or on the snail, what happens to the snail? She, she's in a hypertonic environment, so the, the snail will shrivel up. What about you? When you sit for a long time inside of a, inside of a of the, of the ocean or of a pool, what happens to you? You look at your, your hands and you see all these little root, little shriveled up things on your fingers. What's happening there? You are losing water. So you are in a hypertonic environment, so you're losing water. Uh, the opposite would be true if you would sit in a, in a stilled water for a really long time. You would get into a hypertonic environment and you would get literally blow, right? So think about this. If you drink too much, eat too much salt, that means you're gonna retain more water and you get fat, right? Because you need more water so to, to, to compensate for the extra salt. So whenever you, if you have a photo shoot and you wanna look skinny, stay off the salt, all right? And also remember that the salt messes up your blood pressure like I talked about before. Now, this is a good time to repeat again what we talked about, simple diffusion across the membrane. Uh, that will happen things like, uh, like oxygen and carbon dioxide. It just goes straight to the membrane. Remember, the membrane is always moving around, it's fluid, so it, that means there's space between those um, uh, phospholipids, and if it's, it's something that's not polar, they're good. And then you got facilitated diffusion. We talked about water and aquaporins, but there's also other examples. General proteins are also used to move amino acids and sugar. In this case, you have here an example of a sugar. I know it's a sugar because it's a, it's a ring that's has six sides, so it's a hexose sugar, probably glucose getting through the cell through a, through a channel. So glucose is polar, very soluble. It's not gonna get through those hydrophobic tails, hydrophobic tails so you gotta have a channel, just like the aquaporin is necessary for water to get through the membrane. Both of those examples are passive transport where things go from where there's a lot of a lot of solute to where there's not a lot of solute or where there's a lot of potential to where there's a lot. See, look how many glucoses and how many oxygens are here and look how many on the other side. So that means that if the cell wants a constant supply of glucose to come into the cell or a constant supply of oxygen to come into the cell, it has to maintain the level of oxygen and sugar inside the cell low which means the cell needs to keep processing that glucose and burning it with the mitochondria to lower the amount of glucose inside the cell so that the, the, the sugar is always coming inside the cell, you know? Um, so that's an example of facilitated diffusion, right? Another example of this would be like in your intestine where the glucose is actually being absorbed in the small intestine. You're gonna have a lot of glucose inside the intestine but not so much in the blood, but the, the glucose can get to the intestinal wall. It's going to need 
uh, facilitated diffusion to get through the wall of the intestines. And these, in the intestinal wall, you will find these tiny little hair looking things called microvilli. And each of those little hairs has a little channel that allows the glucose to get through. So microvilli are very important for the absorption of amino acids and, and, and sugars at the small intestine, which is what absorbs our nutrients. Now, and then you have the active transport, which is active transport is when energy is necessary to carry something to the vent to the thing. Now, look at the example here. You have a lot more inside than you have outside. So you have all of these molecules here and not, and not as many up there. That means that if you were going in the direction you're supposed to go by diffusion, these molecules would be going out. So in order to send them this way, like the arrow is showing in the drawing, you're gonna to need to spend power, which is cellular power is ATP. And that's what our next presentation is going to be about. We're gonna be talking about uh, active transport. So we'll pick it up from here. But before we finish that, a simple, uh, uh, one more time, simple diffusion, examples oxygen and carbon dioxide diffusing to the membrane. Remember, it doesn't require energy. And then you have, uh, passive transport with the proteins. Now, this is also, I mentioned this in the class lecture, but just a quick pause here to talk about the different kinds of proteins that you find in the cell membrane. Again, you have proteins that, that do structural support. Now, there's three kinds of support that proteins can do. This example here is a protein, a peripheral protein. It's peripheral because it's not going through the whole membrane. That is actually serving the purpose of anchoring the cytoskeleton. You could have the same thing on the outside of the cell, uh, basically connecting to the fibers that, that connect the cells to each other. And you can also have that to connect the things. Then you also have recognition proteins like this, and usually they have the glycocalyx attached to them. Remember that? Those serve as flags to say, I belong in the body. And they usually have attachments right there so that particles which are trying to ver verify that the cell really belongs in the body will match that. So it's kind of like a lock and key kind of scenario. If you can fit the key, it means you belong. Then you also have communication proteins. Remember, if this molecule here is hydrophilic, uh, it's not gonna get to the membrane. So in order for this message, uh, hormone, to get the message to get through the inside, it needs to get touch this protein, and then the protein will go ahead and decode that signal and initiate a transduction or a cascade signal, which is gonna ac activate the cell membrane. Uh, and therefore the internal layers of the cell, cytoplasm as well, and will create a response on the cell. There's a special, special chapter that we do to go over this material in AP Biology. Now, and then you also have transport proteins like the carrier proteins and channel proteins, which we already talked about in these videos. Now, I mentioned that because some proteins uh, will be doing this job. Channel protein versus carrier protein. So here's what, an example of a channel protein that's allowing materials to go through in to facilitate a diffusion. We have more on the outside than on the inside. It just goes naturally. But this would not happen if it wasn't for the channel protein because remember, these hydrophilic materials will not get through the membrane. And then you have an example of facilitated diffusion by carrier proteins, where a carrier protein pretty much picks up something from one side and drops it to the other. So this is an example of a molecule that basically will bond with a specific molecule and then carry it across. So that's very interesting um, how that works. So again, facilitated diffusion works through a channel like this or through a carrier protein like that. You know, so just a good examples. Remember, the carrier proteins work by changing their shape when they attach to a specific molecule. But this change in shape will only happen if that specific molecule will attach to it. So that's another interesting thing. From now on, we have to talk about active transport, and that's a separate lecture. So we're going to continue from here on the next video. All right. I hope these, you find these videos helpful, and you can watch them over and over again if you need help.